Hello and welcome to Psycho Killer, the true crime podcast about Britain's worst criminals. I'm Simon Ford, a writer and journalist. And I'm Jack Morell. As a former homicide detective, I'm still intrigued by murder cases, especially how the killers try to avoid detection. OK, buckle up. It's time to head to the dark side. In England, the criminally insane are locked up in one of three secure hospitals. In fact, the Queen can glimpse the grey roofs of Broadmoor from the turrets of Windsor Castle. Ashworth started life as a county asylum 10 miles north of Liverpool, but the one I'm familiar with is Rampton in Nottinghamshire. Now, growing up, Rampton was a byword for insanity. Two kinds of people go inside Rampton, the inmates and those who work there. Very occasionally, they admit an outsider. The main building is over-engineered in a way only the Victorians could conceive. They recreated solid rock with brick when they made Rampton. The walls were built to resist more than dynamite. They were designed to contain evil. Time stands still in Rampton. The main corridor seems to follow a constant, gentle curve, so it's impossible to tell how long it is. There's no daylight, no dirt, and hardly any people. Everything echoes. Coincidentally, we were passing a pair of double doors, one of which was open. I heard pop music in the room beyond and glanced in. There was a table tennis table. I suppose it was a games room. The song was Young at Heart by the Bluebells. There's an English expression, putting all your rotten eggs in one basket. It applied to the people in that room. Some of the worst criminals of the previous 30 years were in there. They were older and fatter than their last published photos. Most of them were wearing grey sweatshirts and sweatpants and slippers with Velcro fastenings, and their skin had a yellowish tinge. The older ones seemed faded to the point of translucency. A very large woman was standing closest to the door. She had a mullet haircut, you know, short at the sides, long at the back, and streaked blonde on top. She was holding a red table tennis bat and turned to look at us with a kind of bored curiosity. The music faded as we continued down the seemingly endless corridor. Presently, I put a name to the face. The woman with the red table tennis bat was Beverly Allett. Beverly Gale Allett was born in 1968 and grew up in the village of Corby Glen near Grantham in Lincolnshire. She had two sisters and a brother. Her father Richard worked in an off-license and her mother was a school cleaner. Bev, as everyone called her, was an unremarkable child and a bit of a tomboy. She was always getting into scrapes of one kind or another. As she grew older and those scrapes became more dramatic, Bev's school friends would roll their eyes. Behind her back, they all thought Bev was making it up, inventing illnesses and injuries, and exaggerating real mishaps. Nobody could have predicted what was to come, although with hindsight, alarm bells were ringing. Here's David Enoch, a consultant psychiatrist and a specialist in rare personality disorders. Up to the age of 13, in particular, she seemed to have been a happy little girl who had friends and who played with the others. And there was no specific traits but that showed that there was any pathology or psychopathology. But afterwards, the relationship with her friends then did give some indications that she might have difficulties in the fact that she became uh, rather cruel towards some of them. And then it appears to me that she began to lie. Then she began to prefabricate stories about what she had done and what she hadn't done and exaggerate them. And those would be signs. There was a time as a teen when she broke her wrist. Bev told anyone who'd listen that she'd stepped in to save another girl from being beaten up. But her dad told the landlord of the Fighting Cox pub, where Bev worked, that she'd tripped on some steps in a department store. It didn't matter to Bev. She went on making up tall stories. As far as she was concerned, these fantasies were real. 
She even faked the symptoms of appendicitis so convincingly that surgeons removed her appendix, only to find there was nothing wrong with it. Bev got a stay in hospital and a dollop of sympathy when she came home. As far as she was concerned, the attention was worth it. Bev became a figure of fun in Corby Glen. The village folk tolerated her BS as long as she did no harm. And that's all Bev was to them, cranky but harmless. Plus, the locals in the Fighting Cocks had their own BS corner. They gossiped that big butch barmaid Bev was a lesbian. In rural England in the 1980s, gay people were frequently the butt of jokes and discrimination. As if to prove the gossips wrong, Bev got herself a boyfriend, but it didn't last long. So what if she liked hanging out with her female friends? Her sexuality was her business. Anyway, Bev was about to have a fresh start. In 1990, she enrolled as a trainee nurse at Grantham and Kestivan Hospital and moved into the nurse's home. I played a cut with my homies Dressed in all black and we cozy Can't say you love, you gotta show me with my guys, then I'm dolly. Hey, ain't no vibe like this, they don't rock like this, and you know we don't miss. To say that Bev Allett fitted into student life was an understatement. She was the life and soul of the party, and she parted hard. So much so that it was unusual to see her in class. But Bev always had some illness or another which excused her. After a while, it turned sour. Bev made friends, broke friendships, rowed with her boyfriend. She said he was violent. She said he raped her. He vehemently denied it. She said she was pregnant. She wasn't. Plus, there were some unexplained incidents in the nurse's home. A mysterious fire in the kitchen and excrement smeared on one of the nurse's doors. It seemed like wherever Bev went, there was some kind of drama. After a turbulent few months, Grantham Hospital would have been glad to see the back of Bear Valley. In fact, no other hospital would take her, including the Pilgrim Hospital just down the road in Boston. She was barely qualified and had a dreadful interview there. They turned her down flat. Clearly, Bear Valley didn't have what it took to be a nurse, apart from an encyclopedic knowledge of ailments. But Grantham was desperate for staff, so they put her on a short contract. Maybe they thought they could develop her. Or maybe it was a case of better the devil you know. Either way, on Monday the 18th of February 1991, state enrolled nurse Beverly Gale Allett, Bev to everyone who knew her, started a six-month stint on Ward 4, the children's ward. Four days later, the cardiac arrests began. Kids hate being in hospital, and who can blame them? So the staff brightened up the place with colourful posters and toys. There was a rainbow banner saying, Welcome to Ward 4. The notice board was covered with hand-drawn thank you cards from the children and messages of gratitude from parents. There were cutouts of British cartoon favourites on their doors like Little Miss Giggles, Mr Bump and Mr Happy. It was a happy place where kids got better, or at least it was supposed to be. In February 1991, staff morale was at rock bottom. Big changes were being made to the National Health Service. The focus, many argued, had shifted away from patient care. Now financial targets were the priority, saving money, cutting jobs, and the hierarchy of the NHS had been shaken up. Those on the front line claimed their bosses were out of touch and unaccountable. They claimed managers with medical training had been replaced by bean counters. In many instances, they were right, and Ward 4 of Grantham Hospital was caught in the crossfire. The nurses grumbled and soldiered on. It didn't help that Ward 4's two consultants, Dr Nelson Porter and Dr Charith Naniakara, were at loggerheads. The nurses worked around their tiffs and eccentricities. And then there was the layout of the place. Ward 4 was an 
oblong corridor with treatment rooms in the middle and beds and cubicles around the outside. There were just too many corners. It was hard to see where your colleagues were. It was difficult to see who was doing what and to whom. To make life easier, staff around the hospital started cutting corners. For example, a number of chilled drugs cabinets could be opened with the same key, so it didn't matter if one ward's key went missing, you could just borrow a key from next door. Oddly enough, the week Bev Allett started work, the key to Ward 4's cabinet went walkabout, so the staff shrugged and borrowed somebody else's. They needed regular access to that cabinet. It contained important medication. Medication like insulin. Insulin is a hormone produced by the body to control the amount of sugar in the blood. Somebody with diabetes either produces insufficient insulin or their insulin doesn't work properly. So a diabetic patient needs injections of insulin to top up or replace what they produce naturally. If their blood sugar isn't controlled and the levels become too high or too low, they can fall into a diabetic coma, which is a life-threatening emergency. On the other hand, if someone who isn't diabetic receives extra insulin, the consequences can be just as catastrophic. An insulin overdose can cause respiratory failure, cardiac arrest and death. It's also difficult to diagnose without some clue about what's happened, a mistake, for example, or some other traceable event. That's why the insulin was kept locked up. That's why each ampule had to be checked out, or at least it was supposed to be. That was another corner that staff had fallen into the habit of cutting. Chris and Joanne Taylor were worried about their little boy Liam. He wasn't quite two months old and he had a nasty cold that had gone to his chest. They'd had the doctor out to him in the night. He said it was bronchiolitis. Chris went to work first thing, but Liam wasn't any better. Worried, Joanne rang the health visitor, who called the doctor, who listened to Liam's chest and decided the little lad should go to hospital. It was Thursday, the 21st of February, 1991, Bev Allett's fourth day on Ward 4. By 1.30pm, Liam had been seen by a doctor and was tucked up in a cot in a little room at the side of the ward. Chris Taylor left work early and met Joanne at the hospital. At half past four, a couple of nurses came into the room. One of them seemed to be in charge, and the other was much younger, a stocky girl with a pudgy face and the look of the tomboy about her. The staff nurse explained they needed to feed Liam with a little tube in his throat. The younger nurse, Bev, was going to feed him. He was in safe hands. Chris and Joanne agreed, went home and got changed, picked up their older son from the childminders and had something to eat themselves. When they got back to Ward 4, the atmosphere was tense. Liam had taken a turn for the worse. The little boy Chris and Joanne had left chortling and playing with his toes was very ill indeed. A consultant came, Dr Nani Yakara. He examined Liam and diagnosed pneumonia. He told the tailors the next 24 hours would be critical. The next day, Friday the 22nd of February, Liam stabilised. Then, in the early hours of Saturday morning, the little boy stopped breathing. Doctors and nurses fought to save him. They brought him back from the brink, but his brain was damaged, they said, and they didn't know if his heart would keep beating by itself. Could he live without the machines? Chris and Joanne Taylor later told ITV's World in Action programme, Murder on Ward 4, about Liam's unexpected collapse. He was just lifeless. He didn't seem to have any go in him at all. Whereas it's when we left him, even though he was congested and poorly, he was still he was awake, awake and, and you could still get him to smile. We just said to each other, it must be just meant to be. He's just meant to go, didn't we? And... He looked so relaxed at the end, didn't he? Liam opened his mouth and gave a tiny gasp. The baby boy, who'd come in with a bad cold, died in the same hospital where he'd been born just eight weeks before. Baffled by the tragedy, Grantham Hospital ordered a post-mortem examination. Did Liam have a congenital heart defect that might threaten the tailor's other children? But the pathologist could offer no explanation. 
He'd never seen anything like it. I asked the question then, well, why did he suffer this heart attack? And he says, well, we don't know. We have not got an answer to that. And it wasn't just a, just a sort of like, a, just a plain cardiac arrest heart attack, was it? It was, he says, that the sort of heart attack he's had is what you expect to find in a 40, 50-year-old chap that smokes and drinks too much. He says, it, you know, it's the, the cells around the heart that, was, that had gradually died off. Apparently, want it, and I mean, you just don't find that in babies. During the next 53 days, a black cloud settled over Ward 4. Timothy Hardwick, an 11 year old boy with cerebral palsy, was admitted to the ward after having an epileptic seizure. He died in unexplained circumstances on the 5th of March 1991. Two month old Becky Phillips was admitted to the ward for gastroenteritis on the 1st of April. She was sent home, but died two days later. Becky's parents, Sue and Peter, told World in Action about that dreadful night. There was just no sound at all. And Peter noticed it and told me she wasn't breathing, or shouted at me that she was not breathing, and he started to resuscitate her. I tried to resuscitate Becky, giving her the kiss of life, pushing on her heart all the time trying to organise Sue, shouting at Sue to phone for the ambulance. I was crying, completely lost control of myself. We had to go round to accident and emergency and the doors were locked. So we had to bash on the hospital doors to get a nurse to come and open them. And Sue was carrying Becky and she just pulled Becky out of Sue's arms and rushed into the hospital and shouted, Resus. And within a matter of seconds, really, the hospital seemed to be full of doctors and nurses just coming out of the woodwork. She was too far gone when we got her there, but they did try for nearly an hour, desperately hard. Becky Phillips was the third child to die. The hospital said it was sudden infant death syndrome. Only months later, the truth came out. Becky had been murdered with insulin. It wasn't just the sudden spike in deaths on Ward 4 that was causing concern throughout the hospital. There were other unexplained emergencies where children would have died if they hadn't been quickly resuscitated or, more importantly, rushed to the Queen's Medical Centre 30 miles away in Nottingham. Doctors there were starting to ask questions about the number of critically ill children being transferred from Grantham who recovered once in the care of the Nottingham paediatric team. Kaylee Desmond was a case in point. The one-year-old was admitted to Ward 4 on the 8th of March with a chest infection. She suffered an unexplained respiratory collapse, was resuscitated and recovered after being transferred to the Queen's Medical Centre. On Thursday the 21st of March, five-year-old Bradley Gibson suffered two cardiac arrests on Ward 4 and was transferred to the QMC, where he made a full recovery. The same day, Henry Chan was admitted to Ward 4 after an accident. He suffered an oxygen desaturation attack before being transferred to Nottingham, where he made a full recovery. Michael Davidson, who was recuperating on Ward 4 after surgery, suddenly developed cyanosis, a bluey purple discoloration of the skin, and lost consciousness for no apparent reason. Doctors at Grantham stabilised the six-year-old and he went on to make a full recovery. Then, fearing Becky's twin, Katie, might also be at risk from cot death, Sue and Peter Phillips admitted her to Ward 4 for observation. And the nightmare started again. She had a cardiac arrest that day, although she'd had tests in the morning done by the uh, paediatricians, and they said she was a perfectly healthy baby. Mm -hmm. and then the following day, she had another three. The last one, she was dead for 42 minutes. They actually told us there was nothing more they could do. And then for some reason, she just started breathing again on her own. Katie was transferred to Queen's, but this time she'd suffered permanent brain damage, partial paralysis and partial blindness due to oxygen deprivation. Once again, the paediatric team in Nottingham could find no easy explanation for the baby's sudden collapse. Katie had been receiving one-to-one -one care from Bev Allard. Her parents were so grateful they asked Alec to be Katie's godmother. They thought she'd saved their surviving daughter's life. Little did they know. 
Later, the police discovered that, as well as being poisoned, some of Katie's ribs were broken. Someone had squeezed the little mite's chest so violently the bones snapped. Over a period of 59 days, Allett had attacked 13 children, killing four of them. The staff at Grantham had no inkling foul play was to blame for the unprecedented uptick in cardiac arrests on Ward 4. A few managers figured it might be a hospital-acquired infection spread by the air conditioning. Ward 4's nursing staff told World in Action they were living in a nightmare. I'd never known anything like it, and uh, there were more incidents in the space of six or seven weeks than in the previous ten years that I'd known. It was just something totally unusual, totally unusual that was happening. We just thought there was uh, an infection for one thing, something like that going off. We didn't honestly know what it was, and, we, and uh, I think a lot of us just thought it was just bad luck. It was bewildering, really. You just didn't know why it was happening. It was just so unusual. We were just frightened. It got to the point where whenever a small child was admitted to the ward, especially if it was perhaps a child with some breathing problem, you could feel the adrenaline rising and automatically you began to think, oh dear, is this going to be another child who turns out to develop something serious? Against this backdrop of mysterious deaths, Nelson Porter, one of two doctors in charge of Ward 4, was attending the annual conference of the British Paediatric Association at the University of Warwick. One of the lectures was about a poorly understood condition called Munchausen syndrome, a psychological disorder where someone pretends to be ill or deliberately produces symptoms of illness. The main reason for this behaviour is to make themselves the centre of attention. A rare but insidious progression of Munchausen syndrome, the lecturer went on, was Munchausen syndrome by proxy, a rare form of child abuse where a parent or carer exaggerates or deliberately causes symptoms of illness in a child. The hairs on Dr. Porter's neck stood up. Most cases of Munchausen syndrome by proxy involved children under five. In the majority of reported cases, a parent, foster parent or guardian was responsible for the abuse. There was sweat on Porter's forehead and in his beard. Could the unexplained arrests on Ward 4 be the result of such abuse? If so, were the parents responsible? And if so, why a cluster of cases in his hospital? There was one obvious link. A healthcare or childcare professional was responsible. That meant, most likely, one of his own staff. The lecturer used the example of a recent case, that of Janine Jones in San Antonio, Texas, who'd murdered multiple babies and children in her care. There were other cases in the US, Canada, Austria and West Germany, where a nurse who enjoyed the title Angel of Death murdered 17 of her patients angel of death. With the words ringing in his ears, Dr. Nelson Porter left the lecture. Emotionally, he was stunned. But as a scientist, he needed to stay rational, focused. He had a hypothesis, nothing more, which he needed to prove or disprove with hard evidence. Autopsies had been carried out. There were tissue samples from the patients who died and from those who'd recovered. Dr. Porter resolved to order lab tests on his return from the conference. The probability one of his own staff was killing children on Ward 4 was infinitesimally small compared to all the other possible explanations. As March wore on, the Ward 4 calendar was peppered, metaphorically speaking, with more black crosses, unexplained cardiac arrests. Paul Crampton, Bradley Gibson, Michael Davidson, Henry Chan, Katie Phillips, they were brought back from the brink and transferred to the Queen's Medical Centre. Usually, Bev Allett would volunteer to go with the child in the ambulance. Nelson Porter took Ward 4's nursing manager, Moira Onions, to one side. He told her about Munchausen syndrome. It was possible, he said, that one of the staff was attacking children in their care. Moira Onions was horrified. 
other things had been happening that were overshadowed by the slew of medical emergencies. For instance, the drug allocation notebook had gone missing from the nurse's station. When it reappeared days later, some of the pages had been cut out. Weird. But then weird was the new normal on Ward 4. Moira Onions and Nelson Porter went to see Dr Nana Yakara. He didn't see why Porter's suspicions should be kept secret. But what were the options? Close Ward 4 temporarily? Inform the police? Put in CCTV? These were decisions for management. So they went to Martin Gibson, the unit's general manager. He agreed Dr Nana Yakara should write a report about the 13 cases identified by Dr Porter. Ward 4 should sharpen up its emergency procedures. They'd buy a new incubator. They'd try to find some more trained nurses. But no cameras, no extra security, and positively no police. None of this was to go any further. The date was Monday the 22nd of April 1991. The meeting wrapped up at about 10 a.m. At about a quarter past four that same afternoon, Claire Peck's parents admitted their 15-month-old to Ward 4. She'd been having trouble breathing and was going to be put on a nebulizer, a machine that pumps a fine mist of medicine into the lungs. But it was no good. Claire was still wheezing, so Dr Porter ordered an injection to widen her airway. It needed to be done slowly, over 15 or 20 minutes, to avoid damaging Claire's heart. One of the nurses responsible for administering it was Bev Allett. She and another nurse inserted a cannula, a small flexible plastic tube, into a vein and started the injection. The other nurse went to check on Claire's parents. When she came back into the treatment room a few minutes later, Claire's face was dark blue, her back was arched and she wasn't breathing. Bev Allett was just standing there. Doctors and nurses rushed from every corner of the ward and stabilised Claire, but an hour later Bev Allett was at the door of the treatment room shouting, Quick, quick, she's gone blue again! Dr Porter gave the little girl 100% oxygen, a desperate move that can cause blindness, but it was necessary. He tried everything to save Claire. Four shots of adrenaline straight into her heart, calcium chloride, a glucose drip. The crash team shocked her little body again and again, Still no output. Claire's parents, Dave and Sue, went into the treatment room to say their last goodbyes. Porter and the team, though, refused to give up. They went back to work. More electric shocks, chest compressions, oxygen. Throughout, Bev Allett was observed just standing there with her arms folded, watching. Finally, Nelson Porter went to the parents' room to tell the pecs it was over and then ringing with sweat, he went back to the treatment room and took samples, samples he prayed would prove his worst fears were right. It was an asthma that killed Claire Peck. There was a murderer loose on Ward 4. It was another eight days before Dr Nanayakara's report landed on Martin Gibson's desk. The hospital manager read it and lifted the receiver of what he called the bat phone, a direct link to the headquarters of the Trent Regional Health Authority in Sheffield. Presently, the suits called back. Keep Ward 4 open, maintain public confidence, inform the police. And so, on the afternoon of 30th of April, 11 days after Dr Porter came to see him, Martin Gibson picked up the phone and called the CID at Grantham Police Station. Jack, what happens when a call like that comes in? You know, we think somebody's been murdering children in our hospital. How would the police react? What's the first thing you would do? Well, in police parlance, we used to use the phrase shove it uphill, meaning this needed to go to the head of CID. It would be a phone call through the on-call system. But let's be clear, the risks to both organisations if this goes wrong are huge. I think that at command level there's now an assistant chief constable for protective services. They're responsible for crime and public protection and that fits very nicely to this case. 
Well, the Ward 4 allegations were horrendous if they were true, but Stuart Clifton, the SIO, had to work out, of course, if they were true or not. How much can an experienced detective learn from meeting the people who were involved in the case? Say, people like Dr Porter, Dr Nani Akara and Martin Gibson. And if there is a killer on the ward, does a visit from the police actually risk spooking the killer so that they go to ground? And that's why these initial meetings are so crucial. The relationship with senior personnel must be good from the start. Well, Detective Superintendent Clifton decided to install a CCTV camera. Would that have done any good, do you think? It's difficult to say without knowing the rationale, whether it was restricted to a particular location or an individual. At the end of the day, if it was known that the dispensing of drugs was chaotic, then that would have to be addressed, surely. Reviewing CCTV is a very time-consuming process. And hospitals, of course, rely on procedures and record keeping. So again, I'm not clear on how CCTV would have benefited the proactive intelligence gathering operation that was clearly taking place. Well, the camera, I can tell you, monitored the entrance to Ward 4. Why do you think that was done? OK, well, that, that makes sense. It would identify, I suppose, whether someone was accessing the ward without authority. That could be a member of the public or a member of staff from elsewhere in the hospital and it would strengthen the suggestion that the culprit was a member of staff employed on Ward 4. The post-mortem reports made no reference to foul play, and yet there were these unexplained deaths on a children's ward over such a short period. Surely this would have set alarm bells ringing with the coroner, wouldn't it? What does a detective do if they suspect the post-mortem results aren't reliable or accurate? Well, second post-mortems are a fairly regular occurrence, often arranged by the defence if it's an active case. However, the coroner could request a second post-mortem on receipt of information such as this. Now, although a post-mortem examination indicated that Claire Peck died from natural causes, further tests revealed a really high level of potassium in the baby's blood. Her little body was exhumed and forensic scientists discovered traces of lignocaine in her system. That's a drug used during cardiac arrest, but never ever given to a baby. Jack, how do you go about asking grieving parents to allow their child's body to be exhumed? Well, it's something I've not had to do personally, but the SIO would think through the best process for explaining and arranging this. And of course, there are now specially trained officers who work with families, particularly in the case of a suspicious death of a child. Detective Superintendent Stuart Clifton dug deeper into the forensic evidence, examining the other suspicious cases that had occurred since February. There was a common trait. Many showed very high doses of insulin. The trouble was that hospital maladministration and disorganisation meant that vital information flowed at a snail's pace. It took 15 days to do Paul Crampton's urgent blood test, and then nobody followed it up because of the Easter holidays. And remember insulin? An injection of the hormone can save the life of someone with diabetes, but it can kill a healthy person in minutes. Unlike many poisons, it leaves the body soon after death with no trace. And the same is true of potassium. Too much causes blood pressure to drop, stopping the heart. But dead cells release potassium as they decay, potentially masking a potassium overdose. However, Stuart Clifton had access to blood samples taken from Ward 4 victims and survivors that showed phenomenally high levels of insulin in some and potassium in others. And remember the insulin refrigerator on Ward 4 with its missing key and missing vials? It was Bev Allett who'd reported the key missing. Suspicions were raised further when record checks revealed missing daily nursing logs which corresponded to the time period when Paul Crampton had been in the ward. When 25 separate suspicious episodes with 13 victims were identified, four of whom were dead, the only common factor was the presence of nurse Beverly Allett at every episode. She was the only nurse on duty for all the attacks and she had access to the drugs. 
When the children's blood tests came back, there was no longer any doubt they'd suffered from a variety of attacks. Paul Crampton was shown to have more than 43,000 milliunits of insulin in his blood, one of the highest levels ever found in a human being. The other victims were shown to have shockingly high levels of insulin or potassium in their systems. Some had been killed or injured through other means, such as Katie Phillips, who'd been squeezed to death, or Kaylee Desmond, who'd been injected with air, causing her lung to collapse. Unsurprisingly, Allett was questioned by the police. In 2018, some of those police interview tapes surfaced and were broadcast. In the ITV programme Trevor MacDonald and the Killer Nurse, Allett is heard being questioned by Detective Inspector Neil Jones. The police knew that at least one victim, baby Paul Crampton, had been poisoned with insulin. They suspected Allett was responsible, but lacked evidence tying her to the crime. They needed her to confess. You were arrested this morning on suspicion of the attempt murder of Paul uh, Crampton, who was a baby on the ward from about the 20th of March. Those involved with the case have not heard these tapes for more than 25 years. Do you remember that child being on the ward? Yes, I do. The officers began by asking Beverly Allett about Paul Crampton. We have got this kid for Paul Crampton. He has some harm has been done to it, and you are the prime suspect at the moment. Everything points at you. You I have, have everything the opportunity. Points at me, but what can I do to you say I didn't? I told you I didn't do it, and I wouldn't dream of doing it to anybody. God, why a patient if I hated somebody that much? Did you give that child anything? Not a thing. I don't think I even went in the room. I'm really going to sneak back on the ward and say, oh, here, I'll have a bit of this. Alec continues. No matter how much you don't believe me, and I know you don't, I don't care. I can't bloody lie to you. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you for days on end while I get questioned. Again, the detective confronts her over her access to the insulin, which killed Paul Crampton. Alec replies, no matter what you say, I'm sticking to my story. I didn't do it. I'll be here all year. You can keep me all year. Alec's refusal to confess meant they had to release her and convince the hospital to give her indefinite leave so that no more children would be put at risk. Was this a setback for the investigation? Well, there's an old saying in police circles, give a criminal enough rope and they'll hang themselves. I saw I played a cut with my homies. After moving out of the nurse's home, Bev Allett had started sharing a house with a friend from work, another nurse called Tracy Jobson. Now that Bev was suspended and with the world's press sniffing around, Tracy suggested that her housemate go to stay with her mum, Eileen, near Peterborough, until it all blew over. Allett agreed. The mysterious deaths and cardiac arrests stopped as soon as Bev Allett left Ward 4. Now it was the Jobson's turn to experience the parallel universe that Alit had created for herself. It was to be a helter-skelter ride that left them questioning their own sanity. Money started disappearing from Eileen Jobson's purse. Then the purse itself would disappear, to be miraculously discovered by Alit. Eileen plucked up the courage to challenge her burly house guest. Alit denied everything and blamed a poltergeist. The poltergeist was fascinated by Eileen's purse and its contents. Eileen was disabled and couldn't work, and she relied on her benefit money. But as soon as she'd been to the post office to cash her gyro, you've guessed it, the poltergeist spirited the money away. Soon, Eileen and Tracy were at loggerheads. Tracy defending her friend, Eileen desperate for the truth. Eileen's 15-year-old son, Jonathan, was so frightened he started sleeping with the light on. But he stood by Bev, they'd become friends, and Jonathan, like many before him, showed her loyalty. And like many before him, his loyalty would be betrayed in the most dreadful way. Back in Grantham, Bev and Tracy had had a pet kitten. It was a sweet little ball of fluff, but one day, Bev said, she'd come home from a bad day at work and found it dead in the garden. Its head was crushed. Must have been run over, she said. This was surprising because First Avenue, the street where they lived, 
was a short cul-de-sac. Now Jonathan Jobson found the family dog out in the garden, foaming at the mouth and retching. It coughed up what looked like pills. Oh, it must have swallowed some of your mum's medication, Alit explained. The poltergeist must have taken the child-proof cap off the bottle. Soon afterwards, the Jobsons went into Peterborough shopping. Jonathan started feeling dizzy. He began to sweat and then he passed out in the street. They took him to the hospital where they diagnosed hypoglycemic shock, a sudden drop in blood sugar, something associated with diabetes or in a healthy person, insulin poisoning. There was no insulin in the Jobson house, but some of Eileen's medication had a similar effect. And the last thing Jonathan remembered before leaving the house was drinking some blackcurrant cordial Alit made for him. There'd been something scummy in it. He'd accused Alit of giving him a dirty glass. She'd laughed it off and he downed the drink. Tracy and Eileen faced facts. With the support of the rest of the family, they called the police and Alit was arrested. It was the 26th of July. A search of the house in Grantham that Alit shared with Tracy Jobson produced the missing allocation notebook pages as well as a used syringe. On that day, Stuart Clifton, the police officer, felt he had enough evidence to charge Alit with murder. But it wasn't until November 1991 that she was formally charged. By now, of course, the press was all over the story. While Trent Regional Health Authority had tried to manage the fallout from the allegations, the families of the victims had formed themselves into an action group. They felt the police were being too slow. They wanted answers and they thought the press would give them some leverage. Reporters pursued them and camera crews were camped out on their doorsteps. Some sold their stories, while others refused and kept a dignified silence. In November 1991, Allett was charged with four counts of murder, 11 counts of attempted murder, and 11 counts of causing grievous bodily harm. Remanded to Newhall Prison near Wakefield, she stopped eating, and by June 1992, she'd lost four stone in weight. She'd become so thin that the police were afraid she might be declared unfit to face trial. A Home Office psychiatrist visited Alit in New Hall and declared she was healthy enough. At this point, she took a turn for the worse, vomiting regularly and violently. But how could she vomit if there was nothing in her stomach to throw up? Under guard and with a false name, Alec was transferred to the local hospital, Pinderfields, where doctors and prison officers kept a close eye on her. They soon solved the mystery. Beverly Alec was eating her own excrement. In the words of the Guardian journalist Nick Davies, the discovery proved that the prison had been right all along. Bev was not really ill at all. But in a sense, it proved the opposite, that she was suffering from some illness that was so profound that it beggared the imagination. The trial of Beverly Allett started on the 15th of February 1993 at Nottingham Crown Court. Prosecutors demonstrated to the jury how Allett had been present at each suspicious episode and the lack of episodes when she'd been taken off the ward evidence about high readings of insulin and potassium in each of the victims, as well as drug injection and puncture marks, were also linked to Alet. She was further accused of cutting off her victim's oxygen, either by smothering or by tampering with the machines. On Friday the 28th of May 1993, convicted of murdering four children and attacking nine others, the judge gave her 13 life sentences and recommended a 30-year minimum term. Alit wasn't in court because she was unfit. She was lying in Rampton, skeletal, being fed through a tube. When the sentence came through, she withdrew her consent to treatment. She wanted the tube removed. She wanted to die. It was like a part of her had realised that killing her body was the only way of exercising the demon that possessed her. Or maybe it was a last throw of the dice. Self-slaughter would mean her life sentence was no more than a few weeks. 
But those who knew her best, observed Nick Davies, predicted Bev would soon be eating again. And they were right. Within a few weeks, she was up and playing table tennis with the other inmates of that human zoo. The killer nurse is detained in Rampton Secure Psychiatric Hospital, where it's been reported that Alet continued her attention-seeking behaviour, ingesting ground glass and pouring boiling water on her hand. Critics say she manipulated her way into the relative comfort of a secure hospital. They claim she's living the life of Riley, and Britain's most lethal female killer should be in prison. In 1999, Katie Phillips was awarded two and a quarter million pounds by Lincolnshire Health Authority to pay for treatment and equipment for the rest of her life. Lincolnshire Health Authority did not accept liability, but did acknowledge that Katie was entitled to compensation. Stuart Clifton retired from the police service and contributed to a number of television documentaries, including Crimes That Shook Britain in 2008 and Born to Kill in 2005. He was a central figure in Trevor MacDonald and The Killer Nurse, the programme which marked 25 years since the Ward 4 murders. In 2007, the High Court fixed Allett's minimum term at 28 years and 175 days. This represented 30 years, less than one year, and 190 days spent in custody before sentence. It means the earliest she can apply for parole will be 2023, but she will not be released until the parole board is satisfied she no longer represents a significant risk to the public. The board will consider psychiatric reports, reports concerning her behavior in prison, and hold a parole board hearing at which legal representations will be made on Allett's behalf. Whether such an application would be successful is unclear. It's not unknown for lifers to have to renew their applications more than once and be released several years later than the expiry of the minimum term. And although it's no longer a political decision made by the Home Secretary, the Ministry of Justice recently challenged, unsuccessfully, the Parole Board's decision to release Colin Pitchfork who'd raped and murdered two schoolgirls in the 1980s. Question. Was Alit a psychopath? Well, the Alit case brought Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen syndrome by proxy to public attention in the UK. However, somebody with Munchausen syndrome isn't necessarily a sociopath. Incidentally, the NHS nowadays refers to Munchausen syndrome by proxy as FII, which stands for fabricated or induced illness. And in fact, when she was arrested, two experts examined Alit's mental state and concluded she wasn't mentally ill. Forensic psychologist Jeremy Coyd and criminologist Elizabeth Yardley agreed that Alit should be remanded to prison, not a secure psychiatric hospital. Interviewed for ITV's World in Action programme, Murder on Ward 4, Dr David Enoch agreed with that assessment. She's not psychotic. She's not suffering from a specific mental illness or mental disorder, and that is important. So when the layman might say, ah, she's mad, we would say, strictly, from the definition point of view, she's not mad. There is no psychosis. She has insight. Then it's a question of whether she's a personality disorder or whether she's evil. And I believe in evil. Uh, and I have experienced people that are evil, and I think that today we see evil uh, really wreaking uh, great damage in the world. But I believe that she and people like her are damaged personalities. They are personality disorders. And as such, therefore, we should be prepared to treat them and to manage them and to diagnose them. <laughs> And so Beverly Allett went to serve her sentence in Rampton Secure Psychiatric Hospital, which is where I saw her shuffling across that room holding that red table tennis bat. She'd certainly put on the four stones she lost before her trial, and then some. A killer? Yes. But a psychopath? No. Bev Allett wasn't a psychopath. She was something more fearsome. She was uniquely wicked something ordinary people couldn't understand.
Thanks for listening. We've put links to the documentaries Trevor MacDonald and The Killer Nurse and World in Action, Murder on Ward 4 on our website, psycho-killer.co. The book by Nick Davis, Murder on Ward 4, is available from Amazon and other online retailers. We'd like to thank Paul Mann QC for his input to this episode. Now it's goodbye from Jack and me. We'll see you again soon on the dark side for another psycho killer shocking true crime story.